Praise the Lord. It's wonderful to see you all. Uh, as we are going to go to Hebrews, I just want us to first, even though we're going to start on page 35, um, I want us to go back to page 30, all right, and under 1B, you will see it says, a new and better covenant. Number one, this new and better covenant, which of course is pointing to the New Testament, all right, is built on better promises that's found in chapter eight. Number two, it has a better sanctuary, that's chapter nine, one to 14. It has a better sacrifice, chapter 9, 15 to 28, which is what we did last week, those two. And now number four, it's better results, which is chapter 10, all right, one to 18. Um, of course, chapter 10 has more than 18. It has 30 some verses and probably will take the whole of today if we can even manage to finish it so that I, I didn't want to just start with better results we needed to be reminded what are the better results it, it we're talking about the new and better covenant has better promises a better sanctuary better sacrifice and now it has better results all right um Verses 1 to 4, would you read that for us? Hebrews chapter 10, verses 1 to 4. For the law, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never, with those sacrifices which they offered year by year, continually make the comers thereunto perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered? because that the worshipers once purged should have had no more conscience of sins. But in those sacrifices, there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. Yeah. So it says uh, the sacrifices under the law, because they would bring... Uh, the blood of animals, all right, all different kinds of animals, depending upon what they were capable of buying, all right, uh, the bull, the bullock, or the, you know, the smaller thing, the, the goats or the sheep, or maybe even down to the lesser, which was the two turtle doves or pigeons, all right, uh, it says that that could not make the person perfect. In other words, there was a consciousness of sin. So I've put there under number one, the law was merely a shadow, all right? A shadow of good things to come, pointing to the real thing. A shadow is a picture or type, all right? the external forms and not the real substance. The gospel itself is what gives us the very image. It reveals Jesus as the living Christ because Christ himself alone can and will bring us into a divine experience with God where we actually uh, experience the Lord, all right? Um, I, I want to talk about this, a shadow of good things to come. A, as I mentioned several times, I've mentioned about the pictures of my husband. Uh, they remind me of him. Every room I go into, I have his picture there. But they don't bring satisfaction like he, when he was alive, the real he where we could hold hands, we could talk together, 
uh, you know, he could express his heart to me. I look at the pictures, they're there, but they're not him. It's not the real thing. And so the shadow, though it was needed at the time, all right, it could not bring complete forgiveness. It could not remove the guilt of sin. All right, I want us to turn for this portion, all right, to turn to Colossians chapter two and um, read nine and 10 first. Then I'm going to ask Toyin to, after I talk about nine and 10, to skip 11 and go down to verse 12, all right? And verse 12, we're gonna read 12, 13, 14, and then we will read 15, 16, and 17 in that order, two, and then jump down three and three, all right? Okay. So Colossians 2, starting from verse nine. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. All right. In him is talking about Jesus, of course, which the shadow was pointing to Jesus. All right. Jesus is the reality. Jesus is the one that, and it tells us very clearly in Jesus dwells the fullness of the Godhead bodily. That means anything that God the Father has, we see it in the body and in the person of Jesus Christ. And then verse 10 tells us, you and I are complete in him, in Jesus. We don't need to look anywhere else to get our needs met. Jesus has everything that we have need of. We just need to go to him. And when he is revealed to us, we will have what we need, all right? And, and it says, he is the head of all principality and power. That means any powers, any principalities, any spiritual authorities, he is over them. He is head and tail over them, all right? He's far above, another place says far above, all right? So um, we, we don't need really anything outside of Jesus. So let's go down, jump to 12. Yes, verse 12. Buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. And you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. All right, let's talk about this, all right. Christ has everything that we need. And when we accept him and then go through the waters of baptism, which is the outward sign of what we believe took place inwardly, we're buried with him in baptism, all right? Um, it, Jesus went through burial, all right? And we are buried with him. This is after he died for our sins. But when we come up from the waters of baptism, we are risen with him. Notice the with. It's all connected to Jesus. Whatever Jesus did or went through, when we accept Jesus, we are one with him. It's together with him. It's nothing on our own. Nothing we do or say on our own, but when we believe in him and accept him, then we are one with him in being buried, 
and being resurrected. That's what it means to be risen with him, all right? Uh, as God raised Jesus from the dead, and it was the Holy Spirit of God that raised him from the dead, we were in him being raised up as well, all right? It says what we used to be, all right, in 13. You being dead, this is talking about spiritual death in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh. We haven't cut away the flesh. When we're just a natural person before we came to Jesus, we were actually spiritually dead in sins. But when we got with Christ, we were quickened together. We were made alive spiritually. All right, the, the shadow could not do that for us. It pointed to it, but it could not do that work. But the blood of Jesus, when we accept Jesus in our heart, his blood that he brought into the presence of God which was accepted by God, all right, uh, gives the power to be made alive, all right, quickened together with him. Having, it means when he puts you into Christ, in the past, he's already forgiven you all your trespasses. All of this is being together with Christ, this takes place. All of this comes from the blood of Jesus being put upon us. Verse 14, blotting out that handwriting of ordinances, which was against us, that means the law, where if you broke one little bit of the law, you were guilty of the whole thing. But the moment you accept Christ, that whole law, that puts everybody under condemnation because there's not one of us that hasn't broken part of the law. No matter how good you try to be, there's some place you've gone wrong and done wrong. And so it says that was blotted out, all right, because the whole thing was contrary to us. There was no way we could keep the law our very nature of sin, try as we may, there was no way we could keep it. And so the Lord blotted it out and actually nailed it to his cross. So when Jesus was nailed to the cross, he took all of our sins. He took the sin of the whole world on him. But if we don't by faith accept Jesus, then the work that he did was null and void for that person. By faith only, if we believe what God says about Jesus, accept what the word of God says about Jesus, and we believe in him, accept him, confess him, then everything that he did becomes ours, all right? It says, took it away and nailed it to the cross. Now read to us 15, 16, and 17. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them. All right, Thank stop you. there. I'm gonna, having spoiled, this is the work of Jesus Christ. When Jesus was nailed to the cross, he was buried, and then when he arose from the dead, that's when he spoiled. He rendered them powerless, the powers of darkness, that Satan had the keys of death, hell, and the grave, and he took them away from Satan. Jesus did, all right? He literally disarmed principalities and powers, all right, and openly showed that he was the conqueror 
when death could not hold him. And he came out of the grave. And when he ascended up, it was an open show that he had defeated Satan. All right. Therefore, it's already done. He did that work. But it's only those that believe. Only those that accept what God says by faith, receive it, turn their eyes to Jesus and cry out to Jesus, then they are one with Christ. Now let's look at, because of what Jesus did when he died, when he arose from the dead, he overcame the devil. When he spoiled principalities and powers, he rendered them useless, helpless. He took away from them all that they had usurped, all right? And therefore, verse 16. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of any holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days. Which 17. are which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. All right. There, right, right there, it tells you, all right, that what you eat, what you drink, which day you worship the Lord, or whether you set aside the new moon, the Sabbath days, those are all called a shadow. They're the shadow. They're not the reality. All they can do is point to Jesus. But once you have the real thing, what do you need the shadow for? Okay. Now, I read something as I was studying for this yesterday. And I can't remember, but it's not my own idea. But I've forgotten. I read it out of David Guzik, but he was quoting somebody else so definitely i just want to give credit to whom credit is due he, he said it very clearly he said you know um when the sun is behind the shadow is before but when the sun comes to the forefront the shadow goes to the back. Now, it said all these different external things, all right? Uh, what you can eat, what you need to drink, um, all, all of this, all right? Let, let me go there and see. Um, me drink the holy day, what day to worship the Lord, Sunday, Saturday, uh, which day, the new moon, the different Sabbath days, those are called shadows. You see, as long as the sun, he is the son of righteousness, S-U-N, all right, Jesus is referred to as the S-U-N, the son of righteousness. When he's behind, before he came, the types were there in the front. The shadow was in the front. But now that Jesus has come, the sun is in the front. Then the shadows are behind. Don't turn away from the sun and go back to the shadows. Do you understand? Well, I got convicted. I really got convicted. Uh, today as I was praying and as I was reading the chapter of Hebrews over and over this 10th chapter because I grew up very privileged. My mother taught me well from the word of God and um, she was also a teacher. She taught the tabernacle not just in English, she taught it in a Chinese Bible school in Chinese. Uh, my mother really knew her Bible well. And uh, she had raised us as children and told us never to drink hard liquor, never to drink wine, never to drink 
any alcoholic beverage. And she quoted from the Old Testament that the priests were told not to because there was a danger of getting drunk. And when you get drunk, you do things that you wouldn't normally do. And that was how Aaron's two sons, the two older sons, they had drank wine and gotten drunk. And then they brought strange fire into the presence of God and God struck them dead. Oh, yes. And from there, they were told, don't drink. Don't drink as priests. And my mother would say, we're called to be priests, kings and priests unto God. So don't drink. But, you know, throughout the years, I, I still remember when we went to KK and then I met a brother. He was a pastor. Later, he took over the church. Uh, I remember that, but we went to a wedding and he drank, you know, they, they had wine there. And of course, we, we never touched it at all, but he had a glass of wine. And I still remember, I was kind of horrified in my spirit, you know, whoa, how come he's drinking like this? You know, he, he shouldn't be drinking, but you know, today this jumped out at me. No, we're not going to judge anybody. All right, maybe they haven't been taught the way you have, but if they're part, the body is of Jesus. If they're connected to Jesus, that is what counts. If it's really something sinful, then we need to tell them, share it with them, all right? But to make them don't do it because we learned we shouldn't do it, don't judge them. How can they drink wine, you know? And, and I felt convicted today and I said, Lord, I'm sorry. Please forgive me uh, because I know that pastor is a wonderful pastor. He has the love of God in him, but when he came to the Lord, he probably didn't have a godly mother that could show him Old Testament things and say, as a king and a priest, it's better not to drink liquor and leave it alone. He didn't go around drinking, but at that wedding, he took a glass of wine. And I realized I was very wrong in my heart to judge him because the body is not according to the shadow but the body is being connected to Christ. Amen. All right, let's look at number two. The sacrifices are unable to make full atonement. This is talking about the blood sacrifices of bulls and goats and so forth. All right, those offerings that were offered under the law they were offered year by year. That in itself showed it had not cleansed away the conscience, all right? Uh, let, let's read that one and two again. Would you read that for us, Toyin, of Hebrews 10? Yes. Hebrews 10, verses one and two. For the law, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never, with those sacrifices which they offered year by year, continually make the comers thereunto perfect. For then, would they not have ceased to be offered? Because that the worshippers once purged should have had no more conscience of sins. Yeah, but the fact that they had to every year do the same thing again. They never really cleansed away the consciousness of guilt and sin. This is A2. In the worshipers, there was this remembrance of sins made every year, reminding them still, because that blood was not a, the thing that could wash away sin. It could never remove sin. 
it was only done as a picture pointing to the fact there was coming the perfect offering. All right. Those in the past look forward to what God had for them. We in turn taste of the real thing. And then we look backward and see these things, the pictures and the description and so forth. All right. Number three, the worshipers still had consciousness of sin. Had they been really purged where the sin was absolutely removed, there would be no more conscience of sins. Only, and notice I underline that word only, only Christ can give a perfect conscience, his blood. His blood is the real thing, all right? And that's why he does not have to offer himself over and over and over again, one sacrifice forever, all right? All sense of guilt is gone. There's no more conscience of sins, whereas the blood of animals cannot remove sin. Christ's blood not only removes the guilt, but also removes the sins. And I saw this today as I was reading my own notes here, all right? The guilt of sin is on our part, but actually removing the sins is on God's part. So the blood of Jesus enabled God to literally wipe out the sins. And in us, we sense it and realize it because our conscience doesn't feel guilty. As I was praying this morning, crying out to the Lord, he reminded me of two stories. One you've heard a lot. I will tell it second. But the first one, I don't, I don't remember telling it for a long, long time. And I know it was God that br brought both to my memory. All right. And, and so the first one is, this is a story that my mother I remember hearing her tell about in China. In China, our church, we lived above the church, but the church hall and the whole building, all right, and it had a basement as well. It was on property that was on the very side of a major uh, highway, all right, called Shisabei Da Jie, all right? And um, we were right next to that road, all right? Now, oh Lord, I, why do I go into details? And what they would do, we had a few people that blew trumpets and they had a drum, they had tambourines, and they would go out on the street side, all right, next to the main highway and, and play. And, and they would gather a crowd around them. And then the leader would, they would continue playing, but then they would start walking toward the church. And in those days, the Chinese there in Peking, they were very curious and, and they would follow like the Pied Piper as this group would play their instruments. This group that had circled them now followed them and they walked up the stairs, they went into the church and the people followed. So as they followed them in, uh, there were ushers there to get them all seated. Women on one side, the men on the other. And then when the church got full, they locked the doors. They locked them in there. So they couldn't just jump up and leave anytime they wanted. And then they would start singing, and then later there would be a sermon. Well, there was an elderly lady, an old lady. I remember the story. She had these little feet, you know, that were bound, and uh, she came. She was set over on the lady's side. When the sermon was finished, they were invited to the altar to pray to Jesus and confess their sin 
and ask Jesus to remove their sin. And this little old lady went up to the altar and she knelt there. And pretty soon she cried out loud. She said, it is gone, it is gone. Well, my mother ran over behind her. The women took care of the women. The men took care of the men that were up at the altar. And my mother bent down to her and said, what's gone, what's gone? Uh, in those days, they would take their, you know, if they had money, they would put it in their, like a hanky, and they would put it inside of their um, out, outward little gown, all right? And so she thought somebody had stolen that old lady's money. And when she said to the old lady, what's gone, what's gone? She said, for years, I've been carrying this burden on my back. I, I've gone to temple after temple. I get down and I cut oh, you know, I knock my head on the ground and I uh, do obeisance to the idols. And I get up and I go and I have the same burden on my back. But you asked me to come forward and give it to Jesus and tell him about it. And I, when I did it, that burden is gone. I don't have it anymore. That meant her conscience was completely no more guilt, no more guilt. She literally felt that burden of sin that she had been carrying around was finally gone. And it was the blood of Jesus that had done it. Now, this one you've heard before, but it, it's about the young man that here in Singapore, his sister attended our Bethel church. And then he came and he attended church two or three times. And he came mid week and I was in the church hall because we had a, a man there painting the walls of the church. He was on a ladder painting and this young man came and said, Sister Seward, I came because I want to accept Jesus. Would you pray for me to accept Jesus right now? I've come a few weeks and I've heard and I just want to accept him today. Wow, it was like a fish saying, where's your hook? I want to jump on and get hooked. <laughs> And I was so happy. I read him a few verses out of the scripture. Do you understand it? Yes. And then I prayed a prayer of salvation with him in a repenting, confessing the sins and asking Jesus to wash away all the sins and putting faith in Jesus as the son of God. When it was finished, you know what he said? Nothing happened. I did this two or three times, reading him different scriptures, explaining different scriptures, re-praying with him. Finally, frankly, I didn't know any other scriptures. I was a young missionary at the time. And then I started getting a little bit agitated and sad. And I told him, I said, you know, you have to take it by faith. And he reprimanded me. He said, Sister Seward, did you invite me here? Did I come and say, I want to accept Jesus? And I do. But I'm telling you, nothing happened. Well, I didn't know what else to do. So I just told him, I says, I have told you everything I know. I've read you all the scriptures that I know. And so just bow your head. I'm going to ask. God to tell us why nothing has happened to you. And as I began to pray, Lord, why is it he says nothing has happened? Why doesn't faith kick in when he wants to, you know, and then he said, not me. So God revealed it to him. He put his hand to his back pocket and pulled out his billfold. He said, could it be this? And I was wondering, what is your billfold got to do with being forgiven? But when he opened it up, there was that whoop, you know, those papers that had the blood of the 
tongue key that had slashed their tongue or their back. And, and he had those uh, papers with the blood of those mediums in his wallet for protection. Well, friends, you see, there was no way he could accept Jesus and God allow it while he was still under the blood of the devil. You can't be one hand believing the devil and his protection and his blood. You have to turn away from all other gods. There's only one true and living God. And he said, could it be this? I said, of course it's that. Are you willing for me to rip it up and tear it up? And you just believe in the blood of Jesus? And he said, yes. So he gave me those papers and I just ripped them up right on the spot. And do you know the minute those papers were ripped up, do you know what he said? He broke into a big smile and he said, oh, yes, now I know. Now I know. Everything is all right in my heart. I belong to Jesus. Right. He, as long as he was still under that other and had not renounced that other, he could not have faith. Faith did not. Faith comes from God. Faith is not you. You don't try to believe. Faith is a God-given thing. He puts it into your spirit, all right? And God was able to put it there where faith could latch hold. And as he really believed, he knew that his sins were pardoned. The blood of Jesus can do that. No other blood can do that, all right? All right, now let's go to verse 5 to 10. Read that for us, would you? Yes. Christ's perfect sacrifice. We just said the sacrifices of the law could not make man perfect, but Christ's perfect sacrifice, what could it do? Five to ten. Yes. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. In burnt offerings and sacrifice for sin, thou hast had no pleasure. Then said I, lo, I come. In the volume of the book it is written of me, to do thy will, O God. Above when he said, sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offering for sin thou wouldest not, neither hadst pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. By the which will we see, sorry, by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. All right. How many times did Jesus have to die on the cross? Once. And who was that for everyone, all, all, the whole world, from the beginning of the world to the end of the world, that one sacrifice that Jesus offered was enough to pay for the sins of the whole world from the beginning right to the end. God's Christ's perfect sacrifice was foretold and prophesied by David in Psalms 40, verse 6 to 8. So we're going to ask uh, Toyin to read that. Psalms 40, verses 6 to 8. Sacrifice and offering thou didst that thou did not desire. Mine ears hast thou opened. Burnt offering and sin offering hast thou not required. Then said I, lo, I come. In the volume of the book it is written of me, I delight to do thy will, O my God. Yea, thy law is within my heart. All right, read that eight again. And when it says thy will, 
emphasize the word thy. That means God. Yes. I, del I delight. I delight to do thy will, O oh my God. Yes. Yea, thy law is within my heart. Yeah. So this is a prophecy about Jesus. This was written by King David, all right, so many hundred years before Jesus ever came to this earth, that he would come and he would understand what God wanted, all right? God's, let, let's look under number one, God's dissatisfaction with the sacrifices and offerings. They didn't understand. God wasn't a bloodthirsty God, all right? Rather, God opened the ears of his son to hear his father's will. He opened the ears of Christ to know what it was that God was looking for. All these offerings and sacrifices were all pictures, types, shadows pointing to the real thing. What the Lord wanted, all right, and Christ, number two, understood the desires of God. God did not want sacrifices. He was not a bloodthirsty God. He was not requiring burnt offerings, sin offerings. What did he want? He was desiring for his will to be done. That's what he wanted, all right? All the other is pointing down to the perfect sacrifice. Well, I wrote something here for an illustration. When we as young missionaries went to fire walking, uh, we saw, and he had fangs, fangs that came out of his mouth. And in one hand, he had the body of a person. The other hand, he had the head of the person and there was blood dripping from his mouth, All right? His fangs and the blood was dripping. And one, he had his, the body of this person, the other, he had the head and it showed that he was devouring that thing. That, that kind of a picture shows me a blood thirsty God. God saying, I am not a bloodthirsty God. I did not require all those offerings because I wanted the blood. I wanted to see animals die, die, die. Give them to me. I want to eat their, no. They, all those sacrifices had to be offered because they were only pictures and types. They could not really produce what God wanted. God wanted to remove sin completely. And the blood of animals could not do that. God wanted to restore fellowship between him and mankind. And the blood of bulls and goats could not do that. All right. They could only point to the one sacrifice, which was his son, Jesus Christ. All right. Uh, Christ understood, this is number three under B, why he became man. He says, a body you have prepared me, all right? Uh, without a body, all right, we cannot express love. Without a body, we cannot do the will of God. Don't look at your body and say, why did he give me this body? He gave you that body because the body is what is necessary to communicate with this world, to carry out and touch this world, to reveal the God that is inside of us. You need a body for that. Spirits alone cannot, everybody is in touch with the spirit spirit world. Some are, some aren't. And the spirit world, there's two realms, the good and the bad. 
So, you know, but Jesus understood you prepared me this body. He understood under number four, he came to do God's will, to express God's will with his body. Lo, I come to do thy will. So I, I'm going to give us two more portions. John 4, 34. That's St. John. Gospel of John. John 4, verse 34. Jesus saith unto them, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. Yeah, he understood why he came into this world. His body was not his own. Too many of us think my body is my own. I can do whatever I want. I can use my body any way I want. Once you accept the Lord, your body is not your own. Jesus died so that your body could express the love of God. Your body could express and show the world what God is like, the love of God, the plans of God to share with this world. That's what your body is for. It no longer belongs to you. It says in 2 Corinthians 5, 15 or 16 or 17, one of those verses, it says, and he died for all that they which live. That means when you accept Jesus and his work on the cross, we're made alive spiritually that we should henceforth not live to ourselves, not see our bodies as belonging to ourselves, but we take our bodies and use it for the Lord, all right, and for his glory. He said, my meat, my strength, that which gives me sustenance, that which gives me joy and pleasure is to do the will of him that sent me and not just start it, but to finish whatever he wants. Now let's look at John chapter six, uh, verse 38. John six, verse 38. For I came down from heaven, not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. Yeah, I didn't come down there to do my own will. I came down, Jesus said, I left heaven's glory, took on the form of a human being so that I could do what God wants me to do. This body is his, whatever he tells me, I will use this body to do what he tells me. Oh, that we would learn that instead of acting like we can do whatever we want with our body, it doesn't matter. It matters. The inner man matters, but the outer man matters also. All right. He understood. I come to do thy will. In fact, I delight to do thy will. He recognized God as his God. All right. Let's turn the page. Christ understood. He came to do God's will B, God's will annuls that old order, the sacrifices, the burnt offerings. There's no need for them now because God sent the one whose blood could actually do everything that was necessary. All those offerings for sin, God took no pleasure in it. He did not desire it. See, God's will establish the new order that through, uh, this is for Jesus, all right, that through offering his own body once for all, all right, um, once he offered it for sin and once he offered it for all people. All right, all people. Okay, we are sanctified. We are set apart 
This is what God's will is, that we could be brought back to him, that sin would be removed, that we would be set free from sin, set apart from sin. This is what sanctified, put, put there, bracketed, we are sanctified. What does sanctified mean? Set apart from sin, set apart unto God. Many people don't understand that. They say, I've believed in Jesus, yet they allow their bodies to, you know, enter into sin, do sin, accept sin, and uh, enjoy themselves, but they still claim they believe. No such a thing. God's will is to be that we are sanctified, that we are set apart from sin, no longer should our body be used for sin, but we should be set apart for God. All right, D, God's will is to deliver us. All right, um, I, I'm, I put here the power of sin and this evil world or the system of this world, but I want you to bracket it. God's will is to deliver us from three things. The guilt of sin, which is past. past. The guilt of sin. The power of sin, which is present. Sin's power should not still have dominion over us. If we're really belonging to the Lord, we need to understand we don't have to yield to that power of sin and allow sin to rule in our life. We have authority over it and we can rebuke it and bind it. And then for the future, the very presence of sin, one day God's will is to remove us from the very presence of sin transform our bodies into glorified bodies that's so you know god's will is to deliver us from the past present and future um results of sin let me go through it one more time the past is the guilt of sin the present is the power of sin and the future is the very present where he's literally going to change us into a glorified body. And we will leave this world once and for all and be caught up into heaven and change. Before we stop here, and we'll start with C when we come back, I'm going to talk about this guilt of sin. Uh, my daughter, who is here, in fact, Connie, Connie, you are here. I want you to tell the story rather than me. I had Pam talk once. I had Debbie talk once. This is now Connie, my youngest daughter. She's the one that wrote those two books. And she's going to tell you this story that she told me about somebody in Japan. Yes. Right? Yeah. So, hi, everybody. <laughs> so basically, um, what happened was many years ago when we were in Japan, uh, one of our church members was a young, beautiful young lady. She had been saved for about two and a half years, and she was getting ready to get married. And it was a couple days before the wedding, and she called me up crying and weeping, and she said, I can't, I can't get married in this few days. And I tried to understand it. her crying was so heavy and intense. I couldn't make out what the reason was. I couldn't understand what the reason was. So my husband and I jumped in the car and we went over to her house and we tried to decipher what was the reason, what was this terrible reason why she couldn't get married. And finally, it, it began to pour out of her. She said, I'm, I, before I became a Christian, I was such a terrible person. 
I, you don't know the things I can't even tell you the things I did before I was a Christian. And so because of that, she said, I, I'm just not worthy enough to get married and I can't put my horribleness onto this man. And so we kept trying to tell her, no, but you know, the Lord has forgiven, you know, you've been a Christian these years, you know, that you're forgiven. She said, but no, it doesn't matter because I just, it's too heavy on me. I'm such a terrible person. And I, therefore I can't, um, get married. And so then my husband said to her, are you telling me the verse in Hebrews that says that Christ died once for all? It says for everyone, are you telling me that your sin is so special? Your sin is so amazing that it overpowers the blood of Jesus and that it makes what Jesus said as if it didn't even happen, that his blood has no meaning and it can't cover not only your sin, but your guilt. And he had to repeat it a few times and suddenly a light bulb went on in her head and she said, oh, oh, and then she began crying. But this time it wasn't crying with like hopelessness, but she began crying with, with a relief, with healing. And suddenly it was like, oh, I'm free, I'm free. And she was free not only from the sin, which she had already been free from for the past two years, but from that guilt, from what the enemy was trying to put on her, that condemnation that the enemy was putting on her. And in, in two days after that, she got married. She's been married for many years now. Her kids are, are older and she had a wonderful marriage, but the devil was trying to stop her from being able to fully receive what Christ had already done for her. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, just, just today I was thinking I, I need to have my youngest daughter give a testimony while I was here. I thought, wow, this is a good time to, to let you hear from her. So we'll take our break. It's exactly 10. That's wonderful. We'll come back in 10 minutes, 10 past 10, and we will start with uh, letter C on page 36. Okay, should we all come back together again? We're talking about a new and a better covenant that has better results, all right? And we're talking about Christ's present position. We, the sacrifices of the law cannot make us perfect. Then we talked about Christ's perfect sacrifice and now we're going to talk about Christ's present position. This is 11 to 14, verses 11 to 14. Yes. Verse. <clears throat> but Christ being come... And no, how, wait, this is Hebrews chapter 10, verse 11. I'm sorry, I was on chapter. Verse 11. And every priest standeth daily, ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool for by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified yeah so th this you know this is um Christ's present position is he's seated at the right hand of the father whereas down on earth when they used to offer the they never sat down their work was not complete. They were always standing, always offering sacrifices. And like it says, many times their sacrifices were the same ones over and over for this, for that, for the other, by different people. But, you know, so Christ's present position in contrast to the Levitical priests, all right? Christ's work is in heaven. The Levitical priest was here on earth. 
And remember, I mentioned to you before, the work that they did here on earth only showed as far as Jesus died on the cross. No more than that. It did not show resurrection. It did not show him as a living savior. It just shows him up to the point of dying on the cross. All right. Their ministry, the Levitical priests, and their position was inferior to his. They were standing daily, offering the same sacrifices that could never take away the sin. Whereas number two, Christ offered one sacrifice for sins forever. All right. It was eternal. It was a lasting sacrifice. It covered that whole thing and it never had to be repeated again. And B, the position of Christ, he sat down on the right hand of God in a state of expectancy, awaiting God's time, all right? Christ has perfected forever those who are sanctified, all right? Um, sanctified, remember we mentioned that, that it means set apart from sin, set apart unto God. Let, let's read this uh, Second Thessalonians 2.13, would you? Yes, Second Thessalonians 2, verse 13. <clears throat> but we are bound to give thanks always to God for you. Brethren, beloved of, God, of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the spirit and belief of the truth. Yes. So this sanctifying work is not you and me doing it. It is the Holy Spirit. It says he has chosen us to salvation. We're chosen of God because we accepted Jesus, not because we did anything else, but the fact we wanted Jesus. We wanted to believe what God's word said about Jesus, that's what caused us to be chosen. I've talked before about predestination. No unsaved person can be predestinated. They were not predestinated to go to hell. Everybody's given the same chance. Predestinated means God beforehand predetermined. And I want you to understand, nobody ahead of time got, you go to hell. They're going to go to heaven. No, they go to hell. God never did that at all. He waits to see who you decide to choose. Your own belief? Are you going to choose what the world believes? Or are you going to choose what God says? If you choose to believe God's word about Jesus, then, all right. He chooses you to salvation through the work of the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit that takes you out of sin, where it says you were dead in trespasses and sins. But he takes you out of that death and he creates you a brand new person in Christ and sets you apart for God. All right. But um, it's two parts. It's not just what he does, but it's when we choose to believe the truth. All right. We have a responsibility. People don't want to believe. They don't get the, you know, Christ has perfected forever those who are sanctified. All right. And how do we get sanctified? It's the work of the Holy Spirit. It's, it is instantaneous as far as your spirit is concerned. You're taken from death. You're put into life. But the daily working out of it in our own body and in our own daily walk, 
that comes a day at a time as God leads us, directs us, guides us. And in practical life, he starts taking us away from the things that are of sin, all right? And he brings us into, he says, God, Christ has perfected forever those who are sanctified, not those that he died for. He died for everybody, but not everybody chooses to believe God. Those who choose to believe God, God will choose them for salvation. All right. And the Holy Spirit will sanctify them and his work by his one offering all right he has completed all for us all right we read this earlier but we're going to read it again would you read colossians 2 10 colossians 2 verse 10 and ye are complete in him which is the head of all principality and power yeah we're complete we don't need to look to anybody at all when he put us into Christ as a member of the body of Christ, everything in Christ, we can draw from it to enable us to be what he wants. Legally, we have been sanctified. Legally, we have been perfected, but we have to learn to live it out in a practical walk as it is revealed. The work is done but we need to see it and believe it. And as he shows us step by step, he will lead us more and more into what he wants us to be. D, 15 to 18, Christ's work attested to by the Holy Spirit. 15 to 18. Hebrews 10, starting from verse 15. Whereof the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us. For after that, he said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds will I write them. And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now, where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. Now, you see what it says here, all right? This, the Holy Spirit is a witness for us, all right? Um, as he quotes to us the, what God says, this is the covenant. The new covenant, this better covenant, before it required them to earn it, it required them to produce, and it cannot be. So the new covenant, God says, I, God, will make with them. I'm going to put my laws in their heart. They don't have to memorize it in there. I'm going to put it into their heart. And in their mind, I'm going to write them. This is the work of the Lord, all right? There's, and then on his part, their sins and iniquities, I will remember no more. He's going to wipe out the sin, wipe out the iniquity. This new creation that he makes us, all right, when he puts us into Christ, is a brand new creation that doesn't have anything to do with the past, all right? But he says, where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. So don't go back and redo it, all right? Once God has removed it, he says, there's no need for another offering to be made. Jesus only needed to die once all right the holy spirit gives witness to us the work of the new covenant it was a work of god himself i will put my laws i will write them 
It was a spiritual and internal work. I'll write it in their hearts. I will put it in their minds. It's not something we have to memorize scripture to do. I'm not telling you not to memorize scripture. I'm just telling it, it's a work of God. And I want us to see this Philippians 2.12 and 2.13. All right. Philippians 2, 12 and 13. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. All right, God has already worked in us all right he worketh he's doing it both to will that to be willing is a work of god that's why there's no point in you trying to coerce people force people or even yourself you're not willing you're not willing you can't do it yourself you can't help other people to do it or by talk this talk the best thing is to pray god himself alone can work in that person to be willing god knows how to bring them to a place where they are willing let me tell you this story i've told it before but it deserves being told again I heard this man's testimony. He was a preacher, all right? And I heard him tell this testimony personally when we went to pre preach, and it was in a Sunday school class, I think, that he told it. I can't remember the state of America, that, but it was a state that had open prairies, and he used to ride horseback. And God had, was calling him. God was dealing with this man to preach his word, to come out of his secular life style and to give himself to God to be a preacher of the word. And he just kept, he wasn't willing. He, one reason or another, he had all kind of excuses why he didn't feel he could do it. One day he was riding his horse. He had ridden this horse many times. The horse was his horse. He knew that horse. The horse was so good and everything. But that day when he was riding him, suddenly the horse bucked. I don't know if you know what that means. He threw his front hoofs up like this. And whether the man was riding bareback or what, all I know is when he went like that, the man flew off, all right? He landed number one with a thud. It almost knocked the breath out of him because it was so unexpected. Then the horse came and put his big hoof, all right, his front leg hoof, came and stood on the man's chest. It was bad enough he had thrown him and when he knocked on the ground, he could hardly breathe. It knocked the air out of him. Now he stood there and you know how the weight of a horse and he just stood there and put that quarter of a weight of his body on the and just pinned him to the ground. And, and nobody was around, and all he could do was cry to God from his heart. He couldn't get the words out of his mouth even. He just said, oh, God, if you'll cause this horse, it's my horse, but cause him to take his hoof off and release this pressure, I promise you, I will yield to you. I will give myself to you to be a minister of the gospel. 
he hadn't even finished praying that prayer from his heart when the horse took his hoof and took it off and just stood there while he managed to get himself up from the ground and then got himself back on that horse again. But when he prayed that, that horse was relentless, wouldn't let go till he yielded his will. I'm telling you, God has his own way of bringing us to a place of willingness. He doesn't always force us, but sometimes he backs us into a corner. And then we say, yes, Lord, okay, Lord, when he knows it's for our good. He told that story himself. I'm not telling it out of mine. But here it says, it is God who works in you both to will. That's only half. I'm willing. Some people go to the altar and say, I'm willing. But you're willing what? I'm willing to do the will of God. All right. Do of his good pleasure. You have to first be willing. Then after you're willing, you have to actually put it into practice. And that also takes God to help us. It's not enough to go up to the altar and say, I'm willing, Lord. After we're willing, do we do it? But God himself will help us do that. So it says here, after we need to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. That means God's put it in you to will to do it. God's put it in you to be not only willing, but giving you the ability to do it. Now it's up to you to work it out, work it out. The working in is God's part to will and to do. He's already worked that into your new nature. And then you must day by day work it out by whatever you hear God say, let the willingness come forth. Whatever God says, actually put it into practice and do it. All right. Number two, under D, the complete remission of sins is promised. The removal of sin out of God's sight, out of God's remembrance. All right. Uh, their sin, that's verse 17. Their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Sin is the actual act. And iniquity is the nature in us that wants to do it, all right? Um, the result of remission of sins, there's no more offering for sin. Christ's sacrifice is final and it is complete, all right? Now, we're going to go to uh, page 37, Roman numeral two we've done roman numeral one which is the better results of the new covenant all right uh, roman numeral two is going to start with verse 19 to 25 all right the entrance into the holiest of holies all right um All right, what we're going to do, the first two verses, 19 and 20. Would you read that for us? Hebrews 10, verse 19 and 20. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he has consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. Okay. Um, having, therefore, brethren, boldness, the blood of Jesus, which literally takes away your guilt of sin. Instead, you have a confidence 
the blood of Jesus gives you this confidence to be able to enter the holiest. This We're talking now about the holiest of holies, that um, compartment where God's presence was. You see, under the old, even the high priest who could only enter it once a year, he entered in with fear and trembling. You know why? If he forgot one little thing, if there was one little thing that maybe he had not taken care of, he had, and knowing like me, oh, many times there's, this is not, I forget this, I forget that, I forget the other. If he forgot anything and tried to go into the presence of God under the shadow, under the old, he was smitten dead. So he never went boldly into that place at all under the other. But you and I, it's a blood that cleanses, completely removes the guilt completely. Therefore, we don't have to go into the holiest or the presence of God, all right, with fear and trembling, but we can go in with boldness, knowing that God, the blood of Jesus has been accepted. The blood of Jesus fully takes charge. Amen. So let's look there uh, by a new and a living way into the holiest faith in the blood of Jesus um, brings confidence and assurance because his blood cleanses from all sin. There is no more guilt and condemnation. I want you to put there Romans 3, 24 and 25. Romans 3, verse 24 and 25. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. Yeah. Um says redemption is in Christ Jesus and God set forth Jesus to be a propitiation an atoning sacrifice that's what propitiation means a sacrifice that fully atones for that fully covers I I've told you how many times uh, it's my own illustration, but, you know, if you're in a cold, cold country, not a hot country, but a very cold country, it's very difficult to sleep when you're cold. Even now, as I sleep in an air-conditioned room, if I go to bed and my feet are very cold, I can't fall asleep. Even though I cover with blankets, my ice cold feet just, they don't let me go to sleep. And I will finally put like booties on, you know, woolen socks on. And then when I go to bed, I'm, I'm able to fall asleep. But here, all right, um, you're in this cold country and you want to cover. Somebody gives you a quilt or a blanket, but it doesn't fully cover you. If you cover the front, the feet hang out. If your feet grab it and pull it down, this part is hanging out. You roll up into a ball and cover, but then your backsides hang out. Chinese say, piku lo chu lai. Uh, you know, it, it's like the blanket just isn't big enough to cover you. But Jesus, God has set forth Jesus to be that atoning 
sacrifice, all right, the propitiation, but it's through faith in his blood. If you don't have faith in his blood, that's why it said uh, earlier when we read in Hebrews, all right, um, you can enter in boldly by the blood of Jesus if you really have faith in his blood. If you understand that the blood of Jesus, one time offered, it took care of all the sins from the beginning to the end. It took care of the smallest sins. It took care of the biggest sins. No sin is too great the blood can, that the blood cannot cover it. It can cover all sins from beginning to end, whether it's male or whether it's female. All right. So it says, God set him forth as a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness. It isn't your righteousness. That's why I love that chorus that says, um, Oh, my. But anyways, it talks. And then it says, I praise thee because your righteousness has been given to me. I, I praise you. I sing praises to you. I want to magnify you. I want to lift you up because it's your righteousness. I don't have to depend on my own. My own righteousness makes me feel guilty, but he has given us the righteousness of Jesus Christ. It's fully acceptable. It fully atones, praise the Lord, for the remission of sins that are past. And that is through the great power of Jesus Christ. How does he become our pro? propitiation for us. It's through faith in his blood. How is this grace released to us when we acknowledge, Lord, thank you for dying for me. Thank you for shedding your blood. Thank you for taking all my sins on you. All right. Faith is the new way. Remember we read earlier, by a new and a living way, that's first. You can come into the very presence of God. You can have boldness. You, you can know God will accept you. So you boldly enter into God's presence by making sure you're under the blood of Jesus that God, the blood of Jesus has been poured on you. It's a new way, and it's a living way. The new way you put there is by faith. It's not by works. It's not by your efforts. It's not by how many hours you pray. It's a new way. It's faith in the word of God. It's faith that is given to us by God. That's the new way. It's not our own efforts. It's a living way because it's the way of the spirit. It's not just through religious formality. You can go through religious formality over and over and over, and it does no good at all. But this new covenant and entering into the presence of God is a new way by faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ, in the completed work of Jesus Christ faith in his righteousness. It's a living way because you enter in by your spirit. All right. He is alive. He is there, which he hath consecrated. You know, the Bible says, Jesus said, I am the way. So this new way and this living way is by Jesus, all right? Jesus himself consecrated this way for us through the veil, all right? 
by giving his life, that is to say his life. Remember, under the old and until the day Jesus died, that veil separated the very presence of God under the old, which was nothing but a type and a picture. Nobody could go into that presence of God, literally, except the high priest, and that was only once in a year. It meant God was unapproachable. There was a veil separating God's presence from his people. You could do the work of God. You could do it service for God, but you could not go into the very presence of God. But when Jesus hung on that cross and when he said, it is finished, it is paid in full, that veil ripped from the top right down to the bottom. It ripped open and therefore, all right, it was a finished work, faith in the work of Christ. It was a finished and a complete work. All right, no longer based on our own efforts that are futile. Faith brings us into the realm of the spirit. The way of the spirit is a living way. Romans 8, 2. Would you read that for us? Yes. Romans 8, verse 2. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. Right. The law of the spirit of life in Christ, there is a certain law. A law is it happens over and over again. And this spirit of life that is in Christ Jesus, when I entered Christ Jesus, when I believed in Christ Jesus, made me free, liberated me from that other law, the law of sin and death. It absolutely brought freedom to me, liberated me, set me free, amen, uh, from the law of sin and death. The way of the flesh is the way of death. Faith enables us to appropriate Christ's work. I think that story that my daughter told about that Japanese girl was so beautiful. And when she said it was like a light bulb went off, I know exactly what that means because that happened to me when I couldn't understand something. And then when Christ showed it to me, it was literally just like, Poom! and it was like, oh, I see it now. Oh, I, it was like the realization hits your spirit now you see now you understand all right so that's how we appropriate christ's work that he consecrated that way for us he rent the veil for us he removed that barrier of sinful flesh by dying in the flesh he opened the way for us into the holiest of holies, into his holy presence, all right? That we, we went over that actually in chapter nine. I, I'm not going to go over that again. All right, let's go down here to B. Having a great high priest over the house of God. This is verse 21 and 22. Let's read that, shall we? Yes. Hebrews 10, verse 21 and 22. And having an high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Yeah, let's just do that much. All right, we know that, remember, I told you, once he died and arose from the dead, his work now is a work in heaven itself, not in an earthly tabernacle, which couldn't do anything. It was merely a picture 
it was a pattern of the real thing, heaven itself. But the Lord Jesus literally went right up into God's presence with that blood of his. It was accepted by God and he was honored uh, Jesus and put on the very right hand of the throne of God. All right. And from then on, he became our high priest. It said if Jesus were still here on earth, we, he couldn't be a high priest. I told you the work of the law only brings us to the death of Christ. Doesn't bring us to the resurrection of Christ. All right. Once he resurrected, the things in heaven are now by the high priest. He became that high priest. So we He's there. He doesn't have to do anything to get there. He's already there. We are having a great high priest who is over the whole house of God, not just the Jewish people, but over those that belong to his household, Jew and Gentile. He is a living person, Jesus. The knowledge of what he has won for me brings me into the very entrance of the holiest, all right? The work he did to win it, the shedding of his blood, the realization he is there to receive us, all right? Jesus, as a living person, don't just think of this as doctrine, something to believe with your head. It is all focused in the finished work of Jesus Christ. And right now, he is our high priest. He is on the right hand of the throne of God as a living reality, all right? He got there by the shedding of his blood. He brought that blood there. He is there to receive us to come into his presence. His work as priest over God's house is to bring us into it, all right, into God's presence as mediator of the covenant, all right? Put there the connector. The mediator of the covenant is the connector. That takes us to Jacob's dream in Genesis of a ladder, all right? And the angels and God going up and down the ladder from earth. And God was at the top of the ladder up to God. Jesus quotes that in John 151. Would you read that for us? Yes. John 1 verse 51. And he saith unto him, verily, verily, I say unto you. Hereafter, ye shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Yeah. Ascending and descending. It's a ladder. He's referring to that ladder, that dream that Jacob had. All right. You, you can't just jump up there and, and, you know, get connected to God. Heaven is so far from earth. All right. But God foretold it in a picture, a ladder where the angels ascended and descended. Jesus is saying, I'm that ladder. I'm the way. The angels of God ascending and descending on me, on my finished work, they can bring you into God's very presence. So he is the mediator. He's the connector. He's that ladder that connects us, all right? He's that way. But he is also to enable us to live there as the minister of the sanctuary, meaning the conductor. Connector and conductor are two different things. Connecting, but conducting is where the power flows through. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life, all right? That's this 
to enable us to live in the presence of God. He is the minister of the sanctuary. He's there to pour out to us whatever we have need of at that moment that we have need of it. Amen. To conduct the very life and power of God into us and our situation. So he's not just the way, all right? He is also the truth and the life. The last one is the life. Okay, let's, um, whoa. I think I'm going to stop here. Um, we're going to start with C when we come back. All right, uh, let us draw near with a true heart. All right, instead of trying to cover because the C is very long. So I want you all to bow your heads, all right? We've only just started on him being a great high priest over the house of God. And the house of God is not just Jews, but Jews and Gentiles who have believed in the finished work of Jesus Christ, who have turned their eyes. He's the only truth. All other things are nothing but false. I don't care who they are talking about or what they're talking about. Jesus is the only truth. There is, all right. He's the way, the truth, and the life. So um, let's bow our heads, shall we? God, I don't know really what they got from today's lesson, but I pray that your Holy Spirit will cause them not just to see what to believe with their head, head knowledge, but oh God, True faith is not just mental or mere verbal assent. True faith is given by the Holy Spirit. You're the one that makes faith. You're the one that gives faith. You're the one that causes faith to rise up. And you said without faith, it is impossible to please you. Outward formality will never please you. Outward forms, religious forms and doings will never please your heart. Only the reality of us being restored to your presence, connected to your spirit, made alive in your power and holiness. Lord, where we can fellowship with you, talk with you, and walk with you, and surrender to you, you alone have the answer. I pray for anyone that is listening today that perhaps some of it was only head knowledge before that they're going to cry out to you, that they will touch you and enter into a living relationship with you, and that they will have that full assurance that faith brings, no longer doubting and wondering and worrying about it, no longer struggling and trying, but there comes this full assurance of faith that it has nothing to do with themselves but they have an assurance because you accepted Jesus he is alive he is real he is there at your right hand ministering to us producing in us drawing us whatever our need is he's there to do it may we lord have the reality 
of that relationship with you. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think that Sharon has put on the um, chat Check. room. Yeah, that my daughter will be preaching at this church. It's called Acts Community. It, it's a small um, church, but it's full of the presence of God. She will be preaching there this Sunday. And um, if you want to go, you just follow those directions and the timing and so forth. God bless you. See you again Thursday, Lord willing.